Pokemon Nuzlocke. We finally took a deep dive down the rabbit hole into the world that lies beneath the surface of a standard Pokemon playthrough. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what a Nuzlocke is, essentially it's a set of rules imposed by a player on any main series Pokemon title to increase the difficulty of a standard playthrough. The basics are you can only catch the first Pokemon you encounter in any new route or area, you must nickname all Pokemon you catch, and once a Pokemon faints, you can no longer use that Pokemon, and if you white out, i.e. lose all of your Pokemon, the run is over. The rules you can apply vary from a standard Nuzlocke to a hardcore playthrough, but essentially the more rules you apply, the harder the playthrough becomes. Keen to see how I could do in a Nuzlocke challenge, I dived in literally at the deepest end I could, taking on Pokemon Emerald Kaizel, a Pokemon ROM hack that is commonly agreed upon to be the most difficult hardcore Nuzlocke in existence. I literally don't think I could have went any harder for a first time. And yes, this went as well as you'd expect. I had a number of failed attempts, but this didn't put me off. I was loving the challenge and Nuzlocke through my way, and even though it was a rough ride to begin with, this only made me want to keep trying. After these failed attempts, chat suggested maybe I try something a little less challenging. And with the recent release of Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, I thought this might be a nice game to tackle to try and get my first complete Nuzlocke. But I wanted to make it a little more challenging than just a standard Nuzlocke. I always liked the idea of a sleep lock. And as it was really something that would make it more challenging on me rather than the game itself, this seemed a nice way to make it slightly harder whilst also not going so hard to start with a hardcore playthrough. So what is a sleep lock? Essentially, it is a Nuzlocke, like we explained before. But with a sleep lock, you can't stop playing until you finish the game. So we are playing the standard Nuzlocke rules, catch the first Pokemon in every route or area, have to nickname every Pokemon, if a Pokemon faints it's no longer usable, and if we white out I have to start the whole thing again. Because this is a sleep lock and the thought of potentially playing forever, technically we could, if I lose at any point for my first time at least I didn't want to make this too difficult for myself. So we set a date and my Pokemon Brilliant Diamond sleep lock begun. I had no idea how this was going to go. Remember I did not complete a single Nuzlocke before doing this and the threat of literally playing for days if I had any failed attempts was something that was pretty daunting. I live in the UK and I'm telling you this for context which we'll get to later. I started the sleep block at 4pm in the afternoon and this was definitely my first mistake. But with that aside, we set out on my first sleep block. I started off at Lake Verity and picking Chimchar as a starter Pokemon, giving it the only suitable nickname possible. We picked up some supplies at the Sagam Town Pokemon and headed out onto Route 202 to get shown how to catch Pokemon by dawn. Get given our first Pokeballs and our journey begins. Knowing that we could only catch one Pokemon per route, I wanted to make sure I approached this sleep block properly, so I took full advantage of all of the different areas I had available at this early stage of my playthrough. Firstly, we went back to Lake Verity, where we encountered the god Pokemon, Bidoof. We managed to catch it and nicknamed it Arceus Jr. It became the first member of our party. On Route 201, our first encounter was a Starly, which we named Hawkeye, and on Route 202, where I hoped we'd encounter a Shinx, we instead had to settle for a cricket tot which we named Squeaker. The team was shaping up pretty nicely, beat a bunch of trainers on our way to Jubilife City where we visited the trainer school to deliver a town map to our rival Barry. From here we did all the Jubilife commodities, found the three jesters and got given a nifty watch from the president of the Poketch company. Before heading to Orbra, we took a slight detour onto Route 204 where we managed to encounter a Shinx. Finally, we had the Pokemon that we wanted and named it Simba. We then went on to the caves in the Ravaged Path and caught a Geodude who we nicknamed Jane Johnson or Jane Johnson as we didn't consider the nickname character limits whilst furiously mashing A. And with that, we headed out to Route 203 for our first rival battle against Barry who we made quick work of with our Shinx. Our encounter on Route 203 was a Zubat 
chat nicknamed it Brock and it was sent to our storage box. We then continued through Orber Gate or to Orber Town and headed to the mine area to find Rourke. We snagged an onyx as our encounter in this area naming it Sneck, found Rourke and could finally take on our first gym leader of the run. Before we did, we cautiously did some grinding on Route 207 to level up Chimchar to level 14 to evolve it into Monferno so it could learn Mach Punch. Whilst doing this, we encountered a matchup which we named Amunda. Matchup was sent to the box system alongside Zubat and Onyx, and I'm sure these will come into play at some point through our playthrough. Feeling overly prepared, we then took on Rock, which Monferno made quick work of with a combination of Power of Punch and Mac Punch, earning us the call badge against our first gym leader. At this point, we were 1 hour and 30 minutes into the run, and I was feeling pretty good. Our team was shaping up nicely, and even though we might have been a little overcautious with our preparations for our first gym fight, I felt things were going well and not one casualty so far. Next we faced some Team Galactic Grunts to once again come to the aid of Professor Rohan and after this we made our way to Route 204 to Flamora Town. On the way we battled a bunch of trainers and Hawkeye as Starly evolved into Staravia. After picking up the spray duct from the Flamora Town's florist we head out onto Route 205 where we helped a young girl rescue her dad from the clutches of Team Galactic. We went to the Valley Windworks where a wild goose chase began to get a key from some other grunts bullying an old man in the forest before facing off against Galactic Commander Mars and rescuing the captured scientist. Oh, and during beating up some Galactic Grunks, our Shinx evolved into Luxio. Our encounter at the Valley Windworks was Buizel, which we unfortunately hit with a critical hit. I don't like the crit though, that is brutal. So that is actually really frustrating meaning no encounter for this area. After healing up, we went on to Route 205 and battled a lot of trainers also encountering another Buizel, where we managed to catch it this time and get redemption for the earlier encounter we lost. We named it Life Jacket. Route 205 led us to a turn of forest where we teamed up with Cheryl. We managed to catch a Bidoo, which we nicknamed Mystique, battled a bunch of trainers and finally made it to Eterna City. Before taking on the Eterna City gym leader, we picked up the Explorer kit from an old man. Oh, and it's worth noting that as a Nuzlocke, the underground is a strange thing to approach as you can literally have so many encounters if you count each cavern or cave as a new area, which makes the game a lot easier. So we decided for this run, each different entry point of the underground, we could have at least one encounter for each of those. For example, there are five areas in total with only four being available before the post game. So we technically get one Pokemon if we want from each of these areas as we progress through the game. On our first trip to the underground, our first encounter in the rocky biome was a Skorupi. We called it and named it Agent 47, which we replaced for Krikatoon in our party. And yeah, don't feel bad for Cricketoon. Next, we make our way to Eterna City Gym, made quick work of the gym trainers and took on Gardenia to earn the second gym badge. We then have our first encounter with Cynthia, who gives us the TM Cut, which leads us on to the mission to save the Eterna City Bicycle Man from the Galaxy HQ building. We once again beat a bunch of galactic grunts before beating Commander Jupiter and then have our, probably our closest call of losing a Pokemon as Monferno took the aftermath damage from the stung tank. Oh my gosh, aftermath. We don't get hit by the poison though, do we? Don't say we do. Don't say we do. That would be, that would be like the worst. I don't think we do, I think that's over. Too close, too close, chat. <laughs> With Galactic now once again stopped in their tracks, we paid a visit to the bike shop and got ourselves a shiny new bike. At this point, two badges down and a team of around early 20s Pokemon, we hadn't taken a single casualty. So even if we were three hours in, I was feeling pretty good about the run so far. Now we make our way back to Route 206 on the bike path and make our way through Mount Coronet and have our first encounter with Galactic Boss Cyrus before reaching Hearthome City again with no casualties along the way. We visit the gym and get told Fantina isn't home and find out from chat for the last 15 years I've been playing this game wrong. First time I don't actually need to take part in a Pokemon beauty contest to progress the games. The amount of playthroughs I've literally done of this game in the past, this one and remakes, 
and thought that I had to do the contest to just get through the storyline is actually ridiculous. So big shout out to you, Chad. Anyway, now that revelation's out of the way, we bumped into Barry for another battle, which we win super easy and head out onto Route 209, where Jin Johnson and Jir Dude evolves into Graveler and our first trainer battle on this route. Mime Jr. is our first encounter on the Route 209, which we managed to catch and nickname Miss Mime, which we add to our party in place of Skorupi. We make our way into the Lost Tower, where we battle our way through all the trainers to the top, and on our way catch ourselves a Ghastly, which we name Rick Ghastly. Now, when editing this video, I realized that the Lost Tower doesn't actually count as a new encounter area. It's still listed under Route 209, so technically we shouldn't be able to catch Ghastly as we already have a Mime Jr. on this route. For me, the Lost Tower as it is kind of based on almost like a cave and encounters in here are different to the ones outside, which makes me feel like this is kind of okay but I'll leave this for you to decide. I see both sides here, but during the playthrough until now, months after we did this, I didn't realize this happened. Anyway, with the Lost Tower and Route 209 behind us, we finally make our way to Solacean Town, which is essentially a quick pit stop at the Pokemon Center before heading straight onto Route 210, where we encounter a Wild Chansey, which we knock out before I'm able to catch it, so no encounters for us on this route. We then move on to Route 215, battle a bunch more trainers, and finally, see Luxio evolve into Luxrib before we make it to Veilstone City. We are exactly five hours into the playthrough. We have a nice party but only two gym badges so a long way to go. After a quick visit to the Pokemon Center we head straight to Veilstone Gym. Hawkeye makes and such easy work of all the trainers as we try to figure out a path through the dojo style gym which sees Ghastly evolve into Haunter. Now at this point we realize our team may be a little under leveled for Melee as she has a level 27 Meditide, 27 Machok, and level 30 Lucario. And although most of our team are between level 29 and 31, our new additions in Mime Jr. and Haunter were nowhere near strong enough to take on the Lucario, which could bulk up and really rip through our team. So at this point, we decided to take a little tactical detour to the underground to grind our levels a little higher before taking on Merlin, as we'd been burnt already under preparing for her in a previous Shining Pearl Nuzlocke we attempted. So after a little grinding and also some trades with our friendly chat to evolve Haunter and Graveler into their respected final evolutions, the team looked like this. Monferno level 33, Luxray level 33, Staravia level 32, Golem 31, Mime Jr 28 and Gengar 29. I also attach a spooky plate to Gengar and fist plate to Monferno as well as some healing berries to the rest of the team to help with firepower and longevity. I felt ready to now take on Maylene and her obnoxiously strong fighting types. We led in with Staravia and managed to one hit KO the Meditite with Wing Attack before it's able to get the light screened up and it's worth noting coming into this match this was my biggest concern. If we miss the knockout here the whole match becomes way harder to manage but thankfully with Meditite dropping we are able to cycle in Luxray on the Machoke and get the Intimidates off and not have to worry about that screen support. Then we switch straight back to Staravia, get a second Intimidate whilst also avoiding the incoming Bulldoze from the Machoke on the field. From here we are able to take it down, get a couple of wing attacks off, uh, we take a minus two rock tomb pretty comfortably and that's be the next turn to knock out the macho. Now next comes in Lucario. I'm super concerned about the bulk ups. I can to an extent keep its attack stat in check by cycling intimidates but I have to be careful whilst doing this. I lead out with Golem who I need to try to get a bulldoze off with onto the Lucario so I can ensure the rest of the team can outspeed it after the drop. I managed to get the bulldoze off while Lucario box up. The bulldoze does over 50%. So at this point, I'm thinking it's more than likely going to drain punch the next turn to pick up the knockout whilst recovering a bunch of its health. It's a risky play to bring in Gengar at this stage because if it metal claws, I lose it. But I decide to make the play and it pays off as Lucario drain punch and I get a free switch in, which after the bulldoze speed drop onto the Lucario, Gengar now outspeeds with the spooky play attached and no light screen in play, I'm able to knock out the remaining health Lucario has with Hex. 
This seemed very straightforward, but honestly, at the time, this was a really intense match to go into, knowing how easily the Lucario could cut through our squad. But we managed to do it, get a third gym badge, beat Merlin, and all without losing a single Pokemon. With that done, still more to do in Veilstorm, we helped Dawn with some Team Galactic Grunts before heading to Pastoria City, catching a Ponytown Route 214, nicknamed Ferrari once at Pastoria City. We soon realise our party has no grass type to help out against the Pastoria City Gym. We do have Luxray, but knowing Crash Awake has a Quagsire, we can't really rely on it to deal with this groundwater type. We need some better options. With this in mind, we fly back to Twin Leaf Town and head to the underground where we manage to catch a Royal Roselia and nickname it Majestic before heading back to take on the gym. We managed to deal with all of the trainers in the gym pretty easily with our current squad and before we get to Crash Awake, our Star Aver evolves into Star Raptor. Knowing Crusher leads with the Gyarados, we send in Luxray first to make easy work of that. Roselia deals with the Quagsire in one hit and Luxray comes in to deal with Floatzel. We probably prepared a little bit more than we needed to for this one, but again we gained our next gym badge and all without losing a single Pokemon along the way. And as an added bonus, uh, Monferno finally evolved into Infernip. With four badges down and four to go, we were at about seven and a half hours into our playthrough, making it around 11.30 p.m. my time. As we leave Pastoria City, we have our token match against Barry, which Luxray single-handedly deals with. Next, we ran into another Galactic Grunt on Route 213 before being prompted to visit the group of Psyduck on Route 210 by Cynthia. After curing the group of Psyduck, Cynthia asks us to deliver a package to Celestic Town. On our way, we evolve Mime Jr. into Mr. Mime or Miss Mime, eventually get there and beat up another Galactic Grunt, meet Cyrus again and get shown around a creepy cave with drawings on the wall by an old lady. I mean, Cynthia's grandmother. Now with that errand out of the way, Fantina has now returned to the gym in Hearthome, so we proceed to challenge her with our current squad of Luxury, level 39, Golem 33, Roselia 33, Infernip 37, Staraptor 36, and Gengar 34. Fantina wasn't too difficult to deal with. Luxury handled the drift brilliant pretty well. We were able to position Golem in against her Gengar to get a bulldoze off, and Staraptor made quick work of our mix Magius. And that was gym badge number four five and again without losing a single pokemon up to this point we're sitting at 8.5 hours now and 12 30 a.m my time with only three more badges to go now as we can use surf our journey continues to canalav city since cynthia paid us another visit after beating fantina we head out to route 218 and head to canalav city where we take on barry once again after this pretty straightforward match, we head straight to Canalav City Gym and take on Byron. Now Byron can be tricky as his bronze oak can set Trick Room up which makes the slowest Pokemon on the field fa the fastest for 5 turns. And as B's team are pretty slow and bulky, most of our team would be in an awkward spot if you managed to set this up. My only way to try and prevent this was having my Gengar use its 75% accurate hypnosis on Bronzo to put it to sleep and hope it'd give us enough time after that to knock it out before it was able to get the trick room up. Not having something like taunt here really kind of hurt us. So we go into this battle, we go for our hypnosis and of course it does miss and the trick room was set. So now our main goal is to try and stall out these trick room turns and not take knockouts or too much damage in the meantime. We managed to hit our second hypnosis onto the bronzo despite being confused through confuse ray and take down the bronzo on the next turn with a hex. Steelix hits the field next so we switch out Gengar to Staraptor to get the Intimidate onto the field while Steelix sets up the Sandstorm to stack Residual Chip on our side of the field. Next we switch into Luxray to land another Intimidate while it Thunderfangs for not too much damage. I try to pivot in Roselia uh, the next turn which takes way more damage than I expected from a minus two Earthquake. I definitely forgot to factor in the Soft Stand boost the Steelix is getting from its held item. The trick room ends and we manage to get a Giga Drain off but are then forced in to switch out uh, the next turn as another Earthquake even after Giga Drain recovery would be enough to knock us out. We bring in Star Raptor and get another Intimidate on the Steelix taking it down to minus three as it gyro balls for a little bit of damage. At this point as Steelix is around 55% health I thought that a close combat would be enough but the Steelix barely hangs on 
on to get another sandstorm set up. Because of the close combat drops, we decide to switch Star Raptor out to Luxury once again, taking its attack to minus four with Intimidate as it uses a full restore. I switch straight out uh, to Star Raptor again to land another Intimidate as it goes for a Gyro Ball, then switch to Roselia, who can now take the minus five attacks from Steelix a lot better than it did in the first place. We get a Giga Drain off and knock it out. Next, Byron brings in his level 39 Bastiodon. I switch to Infernape and get super lucky with a Flame Wheel Burn, which sets up a close combat the next turn, nets me the match again without any casualties. Next up, we go on a whole new side quest with the Professor Barry and Dawn. I first head out to Lake Vala and take on Galactic Grunts before challenging Commander Saturn, then Lake Verity to beat Commander Mars, and then finally make my way to find Barry at Lake Acuity. On our way, we encounter a wild Chingling on Route 211, which we nickname Jingle Bells, and this then takes us into Mount Coronet, leading us to Route 216, where we encounter a wild Snova, and fail to catch it after knocking it out, unfortunately, but get a little redemption on Route 217 with a wild Medichamp encounter, which we nickname Cog Zero. Don't ask, it was the topic of chat at the time. We eventually reach Snowpoint City and head straight to the gym to take on Candice, which to be honest with Infernape was one of the easier gym leaders we had to take on in this run. Medichamp could have been a little tricky, but we avoided a rock slide on our Gengar, which meant a Shadow Ball was an easy knockout before Infernape killed a Bomber Snow. We managed to get our seventh badge 10 hours into our run and still not having taken a single knockout on any of our Pokemon. Next up, we head back to Lake Acuity where we could access now after beating Candice and come to Barry's rescue. We get there a little bit too late as Barry lost to Commander Jupiter and before we can take revenge of our rival, she retreats to the Galactic HQ. We head straight to Veilstone City Neck to the Galaxy HQ where we eventually take on Cyrus and then Commander Saturn before helping release the Lake Guardians. Next, we hightailed after Team Galactic to Mount Coronet where we made our way up the mountain beating a number of grunts along the way. Now, if we sidestep just a moment, I was thinking about our end game against Cynthia after beating the Elite Four. I knew we needed a fairy type to try and take on Garchomp and Spiritomb, both of which would be super problematic. I knew Garchomp had the Yachi Berry, so an ice type attack against it probably wouldn't pick up the knockout, and knowing how difficult it could be to deal with, especially if it got up a sword stance, it was probably the most dangerous Pokemon to potentially end our run. I looked at all of the options that we had available to us before completing the game and there was one Pokemon in the entire game I had access to during our playthrough that could do a job for us and that was Clefable. The problem was Clefairy was a rare spawn on the higher floors of Mount Coronet so I had to pray on my way to stop and Team Galactic on these upper floors I could encounter one. If we got a different encounter in here then the chances of getting Clefairy were literally gone. So with my encounter in Mount Coronet yet to happen I knew I had a small chance to catch one which could really make the difference in the entire run. After entering one of the upper floors I started to try to encounter the one Pokemon I believe would be able to save this entire run and I managed to get the encounter out of sheer luck we got the Clefairy, which would make such a difference, at least in my mind, for the final fight of this game. We caught it and nicknamed it Pixie and then carried on to the top of Mount Coronet. The big job now was just making sure that we didn't lose Clefairy on the way to the Elite Four or during the Elite Four so we had it for that match against Cynthia. We take on the last Galactic Grunt and then take down Commander Jupiter and Mars with the help of Barry before taking on Cyrus one last time. The Cyrus match wasn't too difficult with Ruck Luxray pulling a lot of weight against his Whack and Berry Gyarados and then Infernip helping clear everything else up before Luxray finished off his Crawbat. Then on to Dialga, which to be honest, we kind of took the easy way out against the Alga and just masterballed it and then nicknamed it Timmy before sending it to our boxes. 
with Team Galactic beat and the Sinnoh region saved, there was only one thing left for us to do and that was to get our last gym badge and take on the Elite Four before coming champion. Next we head out onto Route 222 where we make our way to Sunny Shore City and our final gym badge. At this point we are 12 hours into our playthrough which makes it around roughly 4am in the morning my time and now I'm really starting to feel super tired. Remember earlier when I said starting at 4pm was my first mistake? Well here it is. In my head I kept asking myself why I didn't start this challenge in the morning or early afternoon. At least if I did that I would be way less tired right now. But I guess looking back at it it was all part of the challenge and I'm pleased I did it how we did. Anyway, this is just for context, back to the game. Volcano was up next in Sunny Soul City and after finding him in the lighthouse, we head to the gym where we did our final challenge. Now knowing that Volcano leads with a Raichu and it having Surf, I knew Golem wasn't the best option here so I went with Luxray which could take the Surfs pretty comfortably and two hit curl back with Crunch. Once the Raichu was down, I had to next worry about the Ambipom. Having fake out boosted by technician I switched to star raptor to drop the intimidate but it only went for the double hit the next turn I decided to stay in and restore the health of luxury from the damage we taken from the Raichu so it's set up for its encounter against the Octillery later on in this match but forgot that Ambipom had access to Thunderbolt, which was probably the closest we'd come to losing a Pokemon in our entire run so far, and this was a super scary moment. Bam. No, 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 no. Oh my god. That's brutal. It's a crit as well. That was too close. That was the closest we've come to losing something tonight. That is not ideal. Thankfully though, we just hang on and are able to switch out to Golem, which pretty much walls everything Ambipom has, having access to only Thunderbolt, Last Resort, Fake Out and Double Hit. We Earthquake whilst Volkner Hyper Portions around until we get a high roll to take it down. To push through this tiny like bit that we've got, we've, we've got going on at the minute and we're gonna be all right. Then we have Octillery to deal with. We switch in Luxray and Wild Charge is a knockout and enough to take it down. Meaning we only have Luxray to deal with, which we manage to Volt Switch out on from our own Luxray into Golem. And we take the Iron Tail whilst getting an Earthquake off to knock out and take our final Gym Badge. So there we have it. We got all eight Gym Badges with no casualties so far. And up next is the Elite Four. So we make our way to the Pokemon League take on Barry one final time and now our preparations for the Elite Four begin. My first thoughts were to try and grab a Gyarados. It would give us a solid water type whilst also a good switch in against Cynthia's Garchomp as well as giving us another Intimidator cycle between it, Luxury and Staraptor. Unfortunately we pretty much exhausted all of our remaining encounter spots where Magikarp or Gyarados can spawn so it made it pretty difficult to actually get one into our party. So after forgetting about the Gyarados, kind of settling on the team that we've got right now, we need to do some preparations. Firstly, we head out to the Iron Islands because I know that you can get a Shiny Stone there. That will then allow us to evolve Roselia into Rosa Raid, which is going to be such a key member of the team. We complete the side quest with Riley and pick that up, which doesn't take too long. There we go. Okay, here we go. Mr. Quibbles, how are you doing, mate? I hope you're well. How are you feeling at this point in the stream after almost 15 late? Uh, I feel I feel better than I did about half an hour ago. I feel like I'm kind of... My eyes aren't as heavy as they were. So yeah, I'm alright mate, I'm alright. But thanks for asking, I appreciate it. Rosarid, here we go. Next up, I needed a Moonstone to evolve Clefairy into Clefable. Now in BDSP, the only way to obtain a Moonstone are by digging them up in the underground or finding a Wild Clefairy, which has about a 5% chance of holding one. We mined a bunch in the underground with literally no luck and search for Wild Clefairy holding the stone with no luck at all. I thought the whole strategy of Clefable was dead in the water until someone in chat, username Kreger, i.e. the hero of the sleep lock, in other words, offered to trade us a spare moonstone they had. I don't know how this fits in with standard sleep lock and nuzlocke rules, but we were nearly 15 hours into our playthrough at this point, and it being 7am my time, with me being awake over like 24 hours at this point, I felt it was okay. So after evolving Roserade and Clefable, uh, Elite 4 prep is kind of 
coming to the start where we need to decide to grind up our levels and decide what level that we're going to go for with our team. So our basic plan against most of the Elite Four was fine. We had answers to most of the tricky Pokemon we'd face along the way, which we'll cover as we get into those matches. But Cynthia was always going to be the most difficult of them all. The idea was against Cynthia to use Aclefable and set up cosmic powers in front of Spiritomb, which didn't really hit us for too much damage. And then this would allow us to use X special attacks to boost its attack while recovering through Moonlight and then set up an entire sweep on the rest of her team. It meant that we didn't take too much damage from Garchomp's Earthquakes, we were immune to its... Uh, Dragon Claw, we wouldn't take much damage from its Poison Jabs, and Moonblast would pretty much be a two-hit KO on most things on her team. So if we could get this set up at the start, it makes that so much easier. We do have a lot of ways to kind of back up the Clefable strategy, so we have Double Intimidate in the team, and we have single ways to deal with her other threats with other Pokemon that we have. But if the Clefable can kind of pull this off, then it would be very useful. So if the worst happens, we do have other options. Plus Gengar with Dazzling Gleam, we could utilize to take down the Garchomp. The first thing we do is head out to the underground to level grind everything up. As we've come so far at this point, I didn't really want to head in prematurely. So we set a goal for each of our Pokemon to be a minimum of level 65 and anything higher whilst leveling up the rest of the team would be a bonus. Cynthia's highest level Pokemon was her Garchomp at level 66, so this felt okay. So at the 15 hour mark into our sleep block, we enter the underground on our final stretch of the playthrough. And this is where literally our first setback of the entire thing happens. We had beat all eight gym leaders, conquered Team Galactic and made our way through a number of rival and random battles without losing a single Pokemon and an hour of grinding later, while we were finishing leveling up our Luxury, we faced down against a level 55 Giraffe Rig. Like all of the other Giraffe Rigs before this one, we discharged with our Luxury and to my shock, it used <laughs> Miracord to knock out our Luxury. That is literally the worst thing that could have happened. That is literally the worst thing that could have happened. I can't believe that. I can't believe that. I cannot believe that. Taking our first death. We were literally at the point where we didn't need to level it up anymore. We were using it to level up other Pokemon with the XP we were getting in our party and did not expect the Miracord to come out. And all I will say here is I was devastated. We played for such a long time. Luxury was gonna be such a key member to our team for the Elite Four and like literally 15 hours of getting this thing prepared and it's just gone to the random giraffe rig. I was absolutely devastated. So 16 hours into the playthrough and it's 8 a.m. my time, 25 hours of me being awake and I had lost probably the most important Pokemon of the team. And I was already finding it super difficult to stay awake and concentrate properly. With this on top of that, and the thought of going through another playthrough if we didn't manage to beat the Elite Four and Cynthia was really hard to kind of think about at this point. So myself and chat tried to figure out a replacement in our party of six. We talked about Gyarados again. It was suggested we fish in the Snow Point Underground as it was the one of the few areas we had on our encounter table left. But then we figured out the hard way that you couldn't actually fish in the underground. The issue was at this point, replacing Luxray was nearly impossible. It really acted as a pseudo dark type with crunch. It had a pivot with Volt Switch, offered strong electric attacks, which were great against things like Melotic of Cynthia's, and it had Intimidate as well. So nothing really kind of came close to like equaling all of those markers we had for it. In the underground right now, after realizing that we couldn't actually fish in certain areas, so the Magic Hop wasn't really a goal, we finally decided rather than try to replace Luxury with another Pokemon, to use our first encounter in this area on a Luxio that appeared. So on Snow Point Underground, we eventually find one and were able to catch it at level 52. Luxio had intimidated, thankfully, which although it was a setback, put us back on track eventually. 
So now we had all of our six selected. We started the level grind again, which we had a little bit of help. Speed the process up as another user in chat offered to trade me a bunch of lucky eggs, which massively cut down the time needed to level everything up. And a big shout out to who did that. No names needed here, but you know who you are. Even with the lucky eggs though, we still spent another two hours at this point grinding up our team. Two hours later. We sorted out our items and movesets, and on 18 hours into the playthrough, we were finally ready to head into the Elite Four. The current team as we enter is Star Raptor level 67, Clefable 68, Roserade 66, Gengar 65, Infernib 68, and Luxray 62. Right, okay friends. Let's do it. First up, we have Elite Four member Aaron. His team consisted of Dustox, Heracross, Vesper Queen, Beautifly, and Drapion. The only tricky Pokemon I felt Aaron had were his Heracross, which had a Flame Orb to proc its own Guts ability. This could become problematic if left unchecked. And his Scope Lens Sniper Drapion, which even after Intimidate Cycling could negate the drops with the higher chance of landing critical hits. We decide to lead off into the match with our Star Raptor and Brave Bird straight into the Dust Tox, which we knew would be a one hit kill. Next comes in his Heracross. Now this is something I should have checked, but the Heracross is a jolly nature, so I was unsure if our Star Raptor would add speed or not. I worked out if we had at least 16 speed EVs invested into Star Raptor, we would be able to outspeed the Heracross, and this is something that we should have gained throughout our playthrough. But being unsure about this at the time, it made the decision to stay in a little more difficult. I eventually decided to commit to Star Raptor and went for an Aerial Ace. And as Heracross was four times weak to this flying type attack, it would be enough to pick it up. If we undersped the Heracross though, we risked being knocked out from a rock slide. But thankfully the worry was for nothing as we moved first and picked up a clean one hit kill. Beautifly came in next and then Vesper Queen which both dropped to Brave Burge which helped self proc our own wiki berry to gain some nice health back. And then Drapion hit the field as Aaron's last Mon. We switched into Luxray to land a key Intimidate and then switched straight back to Star Raptor baiting the incoming Earthquake it had. As Drapion is now in minus 2 attack, we then took some time to heal up our Pokemon whilst avoiding any high chance critical hits. We then proceeded to aerial ace three times in a more comfortable position to pick up the knockout and take our first victory against Aaron. Although a little stressful at times, this was a nice match to ease us into the final stretch of our playthrough and a bonus that we hadn't taken any more casualties. Next we had Bertha. Her team consisted of Quagsire, Sudowoodo, Golem, Wishcash and Hippowdon. We led in with our Rosa Raid, and we had an easy knockout on the Quagsire with Giga Drain. Wishcash hit the field next, which carried the Rindo Berry, meaning it would half the damage of our Giga Drain. It also had Ice Beam, which could hit us in return for super effective damage. But doing the calculation beforehand, we knew we had a high chance to pick up the knockout even through the Rindo Berry. So we decided to stay in and commit to the play. And it paid off as we picked up our second knockout pretty easy onto Wishcash. Next came in Sudowoodo. We had a good chance to pick up the knockout on it with Giga Drain, although we were a little cautious. If we missed the knockout, it would be able to revenge kill us with Head Smash, coming off its adamant nature. So rather than take the risk, we switched into Luxray to get an Intimidate off and then pivoted back to Roserade with a Volt Switch. The damage took Sudowoodo down to about 50% damage, which then allowed Roserade to come in, taking the minus one attack Head Smash comfortably and getting the Giga Drain off for the knockout. Golem was next up for Bertha, we used the same tactic as we did against Sudowoodo and switched in a Luxray to land an Intimidate whilst also baiting an incoming Earthquake from it as we switched straight into Star Raptor to land another Intimidate and putting its attack down to minus two. The next turn we felt we were safe enough to switch into Infernip as a Stone Edge was likely to come out from the Golem. But this kind of backfired when it landed a critical hit on us and we took far too much damage. In an awkward spot now we decided to bring in Clefable. As Golem was already weakened from the Intimidate, we decided to Cosmic Power up in front of it, which would help us better deal with the Hippowdon in the back. Thankfully, whilst doing this, the Heavy Slam didn't land a critical hit, allowing us to set up our defenses and pick up a knockout onto it with Ice Beam. Hippowdon came in as Bertha's final Pokemon, and with two Ice Beams, it meant we were able to get our second victory, moving us on without taking another casualty along the way. Pixie's done well in that battle. Oosh, oosh, right, I'll we heal up our team and then prepare for our next match against Elite Four member Flint. So we decide to lead with Star Raptor and give it a Chester Berry. 
which will then allow us enough room, hopefully, to take the hypnosis, heal the status condition, and knock it out before being able to land a second one. Also, identifying that Luxray was our main option against Driftlim, and it having Will-O-Wisp, we attached a Roust Berry on it to alleviate any burn status that could potentially come out from that Pokemon. With our team ready to go, we went into our next match leading off with Star Raptor. We land a key Intimidate onto the predominantly physical attacking Rapidash. We do get a bit lucky here where we avoid an Iron Tail whilst landing a Brave Bird which actually picks up the clean one hit KO onto Rapidash. The Chester Berry really never came into play but I still feel like it was the right play at the time. Next comes in Steelix. We switch to Luxray to get an Intimidate and switch straight into Inferno, which really walls the entire Steelix moveset, only having access to Iron Tail, Crunch, Thunder Fang and Fire Fang. We use this time to set up our attack stat with Power Up Punch until the Steelix faints. Love Punny comes in next and goes down to a single Mac Punch and then Drift Blim falls to a plus 4 Flare Blitz. Definitely a little overkill here. Flint's final Pokemon Infernape comes in next and rather than risking a speed tie and losing our own Infernape, uh, we decide to switch to Star Raptor, get an Intimidate off and then go straight into Luxray to land a double Intimidate. We then Volt Switch with our own Luxray whilst taking a close combat comfortably and bringing Gengar to finish it off with a Shadow Ball. Flint was down and we were another step closer to finishing this run so far without any casualties to note. Lucian was up next and our final Elite Four member before Cynthia. His team was made up of Mr. Mime, Giraffe Rig, Medichamp, Alakazam and Bronzog. I was conscious that the Mr. Mime had light screen and reflect. I wanted to try and knock it out before I was able to get those set up, especially considering its held item was a light clear item, which extended the screens on the field to 8 turns rather than the normal 5. Gengo was probably our best chance to do this. We looked at this and as long as Mr. Mime didn't have max speed IVs, we would be able to outspeed it with Gengar and our own Shadow Ball had about an 81% chance to knock it out depending on how it was EV trained. The risk here was if we didn't outspeed it and it did go for the Psychic first, it would be able to clean out our Gengar before we were able to do anything. But with the small chances here, knowing that the Mr. Mime was bold nature and it had trick room, it was probably a little bit more slower and bulkier, we decided to commit to the Gengar play and led it into Lucian's Mr. Mime. And in the first turn, we did in fact find out that we outsped it and landed the Shadow Ball, but just missed the knockout, allowing Mr. Mime to set up the light screen. The next turn, we tried to pick up the KO, but Lucian used a full restore and the Shadow Ball only did around 40% damage, meaning the next turn, we would miss the knockout and go down to a Psychic. We decided to switch into Clefable at this point and use the time to stall out the light screens by setting up our own Cosmic Powers. We managed to get three Cosmic Powers off during the barrage of Psychic attacks uh, from Mr. Mime and pick up the knockout with a few Moon Blasts as the light screen fades. Next comes in Alakazam, now knowing it has Nasty Plot and the Moon Blast would at least be a 2 hit KO here, we decided not to give it room to do this and switched into Luxray. It went for a future sight rather than anything else as we crunched and picked up a clean knockout. Next came in Medichamp, so we switched straight to Star Raptor, which outspeeds and actually gets the Brave Bird off before it's able to do anything, so that was a nice easy knockout. Drafferig came in next and at this point it only felt right to pull Luxray back onto the field to claim some redemption for its lost brethren from earlier in the playthrough. Drafferig sets up a trick room as we take the future side hit from earlier set up by the Alakazam as we crunch for around 60% damage. Next turn we heal up with a full restore whilst taking a psychic and this sets up the next turn knockout with a crunch going for a full circle on the whole Luxray Giraffe Rig arc. I'm not gonna lie that is very satisfying. Lucian then sends in his final Pokemon Bronzog. Known it's predominantly a physical attacker with Earthquake, Payback and Gyrable, we take full advantage of our Timidate users once again. We first switch to Star Raptor as we bait another Earthquake coming in on our Luxray slot, giving us our first attack drop onto the Bronzong. We then switch into Luxray and then back to Star Raptor to put the Bronzong down to minus 3 attack, and eventually bring in Infernip as the Bronzong sets up Trick Room. At this point, after the Trick Room was set, I worry about a potential Earthquake critical hit onto our Infernip from the Bronzong, and then us flare blitzing and going down to the recoil damage. 
So rather than take the risk here, I switch out cautiously again to Star Raptor and then back into Luxray after this to get the Bronzong's attack down even further. At this point, I then take a turn to heal Luxray up with a max potion and then go for the crunches the following turn while the Trick Room ends. We just missed the knockout with our second crunch while he sets another Trick Room up. But Lucian decides to not go for the full restore the following turn and another crunch is able to take the Bronzong down after we comfortably take an earthquake from the minus 5 attacking Bronzong. Lucian was done and we only had Cynthia left with no casualties in the Elite 4 going into our final test. Now Cynthia's team was made up of a level 61 Spiritomb, level 60 Roserade, 60 Gastrodon, 63 Lucario, 63 Melotic and level 66 Garchomp. The whole idea was to lead into Spiritomb and Cosmic Power with Clefable to set up an entire sweep of our team with a combination of Moonblast and Ice Beam. But as we all know in Pokemon, plans don't always work out like we want them to. So we set up our team, healed up and head into our final match of this run against Cynthia, having only taken one casualty so far in the entire thing. At this point it was 11am my time, I'd been up 29 hours and was ready for this to be over. But also so scared of failing at this last hurdle, meaning if we failed we would have to start this whole thing over again. So, here's how it goes. We lead out as planned with Clefable and start to set up our cosmic powers. She leads with the Spiritomb and goes for Shadow Balls. We managed to get three Cosmic Powers set up, but unfortunately take three Shadow Ball Special Defense drops along the way, meaning our defense was buffed, but our Special Defense wasn't exactly where we wanted it to be. So against threats like Roserade, which would come in later in this match, we had to deviate from our initial plan. We managed to land two Moon Blasts after this and pick up the knockout onto Spiritomb. And next comes in the Roserade. Knowing that our special defense hadn't really got any boosts, we didn't really want to leave the Clefable in against the Roserade and its powerful Sludge Bomb attacks, especially when boosted by the Expert Bell it held. So we switch straight into Staraptor and go for a Brave Bird as it Sludge Bombs for around 50% damage. Our Citrus Berry procs here and we pick up the clean knockout with our own Brave Bird attack. Two down, four more to go. Next comes in the Melotic. This gives us a chance to switch into Luxray and use the time we have while it scalds to heal up our Clefable and Staraptor which are going to be really important for later in this match. After a few turns of recovery we then Volt Switch out onto the Melotic into our Roserade which is able to come in and knock out with a Giga Drain. Cynthia's Gastrodon comes in next and goes down to another Giga Drain and then Lucario comes in to take its place. We switch into Infernip and knowing it outsped goes straight for a Flare Blitz picking up the knockout and leaving Cynthia with her only Pokemon Garchomp left. We switch into Staraptor to get an Intimidate off onto the Garchomp, put it down to minus one attack and decide to Brave Bird on our first turn which we know will do around 50% damage so we don't leave a potential Sword Stance play from the Garchomp unpunished. It goes actually for a Dragon Claw and does over 50% damage while we Brave Bird and does a little less than we expected. The next turn we decide to switch to Clefable thinking that Garchomp probably goes for another Dragon Claw. And if we guess right it means we get a free switch in which could help us close this match up. I worry about a potential Sword Stance but in that scenario we would just have to play around with our Intimidate users again to try and create a better opening for Clefairy to come in and close this match up. So we make the switch and Garchomp actually goes for the Dragon Claw, giving us the free switch into Clefable and the opening we needed. Now on minus one attack we know we can take any of Garchomp's incoming attacks, either the Earthquake or the Poison Jab. We click into our final potential move of the game in Moonblast and take a Poison Jab and see Clefable take it super comfortably as the Moonblast finally comes out and pick up the knockout as we beat the game. We had finally done it. We had finally complete our first ever sleep lock challenge after 19 and a half hours of play. The relief was overwhelming and my exhaustion immediately hit in. With a mix of emotions knowing I had achieved something pretty epic, at least in my eyes. This was a crazy journey and only taking one Pokemon death the entire run felt pretty good as well. Of course it would have been nice and better if we had done this without taking a single lost Pokemon, but all things considered, I'll take this all day long. So that's how we managed to complete our first ever sleep lock challenge with only losing one Pokemon along the entire 19 and a half hour run. 
Thank you so much for joining me along the ride of this challenge. I really do hope you enjoyed the journey as much as I did, and this definitely won't be the last sleep lock we do. So until the next one, friends, 